All right, today I'm going to be introducing the third part of uh, the course this semester, which is pre-machine learning. Um, some of you might have some vague idea of what machine learning is. Uh, I'll try to scope it out a little bit more in this lecture. I also want to identify uh, the three main categories of machine learning. We have uh, supervised uh, machine learning, unsupervised, and reinforcement. You'll have some idea of what those are. Uh, we're going to focus on the first two, supervised and unsupervised, which is uh, cases where you can learn from data. <coughs> I'm also going to give you a preview of some of the packages we're going to be learning later um, in this semester and also motivating why we need to um, kind of move a little bit more in a mathematical direction, some of that of you that will appeal to uh, before we could dive, dive into this. So let me start with something that you're all very familiar with, which is writing functions. Um, in our experience, programmers write some code, that's how you get a function. Uh, once you have a function, you can give it some inputs and then you get some outputs as a result. Uh, many different kinds of functions in the world, uh, and some functions are models. And a model is just something that's making some sort of prediction, right? So I could have a function here where I maybe try to predict uh, the market price of a house. So I could feed in, um, you know, maybe some attributes about the house as my parameters, like how many beds does it have. This one has one bath. It was from 1985, and I, I can return a predicted price. In this case, uh, 190k. Okay, so many, many functions are used as models. And um, it, it turns out that when we are using these functions as models, there's other ways that we could generate our function than just writing a bunch of code uh, by hand. Um, but before I get to that, you can also see that here I have an example where I have many different rows fed into the function and then many different outputs. Um, so, so as I was saying, right, we could, instead of writing these by hand, uh, we could automatically generate them with some sort of machine learning algorithm. And uh, when we're doing that, when we're generating a function from some algorithm, that's called trading. We're trading the model. And to do that, we usually have to have lots of trading data, right? So here I have some data uh, where I have those same attributes. These are a different set of houses, and we have these attributes and the price for them. And the learning algorithm to try to figure out the relationship between the price and these other attributes. And then later when we have live data, uh, we can make predictions on what the price is, even if we don't have that same um, input data. And you can imagine why that'd be useful to, uh, I don't know, tax assessors or, or real estate agents. Okay, so that was a specific example. Let's broaden a little bit about and talk about the different kinds of uh, machine learning. Um, in general, when you're learning, uh, you can think about what are you learning from. Um, one place you can obviously learn things is from data, and that's going to be the focus this semester. Uh, the other place that you can learn that's maybe a less um, uh, less obvious is from trial and error. You can take actions and see what, what happens. And that third category is called reinforcement learning. Um, and I'm just going to mention it briefly because I'm not going to talk about it anymore this semester. Uh, but in reinforcement learning, you have some sort of agent. And an agent is just some code uh, that can make a decision. Um, and it can also be made aware of the outcomes of a decision. And from that, it can, uh, well, do two things, right? It can try to make decisions that lead to good outcomes and um, it also make decisions that uh, lead to learning, right? Um, so you could certainly imagine tying this into things we've done in this uh, course this semester. For example, um, uh, let's say we wanna run some A-B testing to figure out the best version of the site. And there's all these things we can change, like you know, font size, color, what images we're using, um, you know, layout of links. And you can imagine an agent automatically doing these experiments and then uh, kind of deciding what A-B experiments to do next and just kind of iterating on that to drive it towards the best state. Um, so definitely an interesting field, uh, but not what we're gonna focus on. We're gonna mo more focus on for the rest of the semester um, learning from data. So we have some sort of data set. Uh, what can we learn from it? Um, and we cannot uh, really do more experiments, right? We can't say, oh, I wonder what would happen if I had this kind of data and then find out where we're just kind of fixed with the data we have. Now, uh, if we are just limited to certain data, there's two possibilities. Um, one is that the data is labeled in some way. And uh, by labeled, I mean that we want to ultimately predict things. And uh, a label is just kind of the previous outcome for the rows we have, right? So data can be labeled. If it's labeled, then we're going to do what's called supervised machine learning. Um, if there is no label, and we just have a bunch of uh, maybe columns and there's no special column that we're trying to uh, predict, we're just trying to look for general patterns or relationships between the columns, uh, that would be an example of unlabeled data. 
<coughs> so going back to this example we had before of the houses, this is a case where we do have labeled data, right? The label is the price. That's what we want to predict. And since we have that information, uh, this is a supervised learning problem, right? How can we, uh, given all of this known uh, data about price and uh, house attributes, how can we uh, kind of figure out what that relationship is? Okay. Now, in this case, the thing we're trying to um, figure out is a continuous variable, right? I mean, a house could be any any price. There's not a fixed set of prices. And so this is a regression problem. And the function that we generate with our machine learning algorithm uh, is called a regressor. Okay, so that's one kind of uh, prediction we'll want to do. Um, the other case that we might end up with is uh, we might have a classifier. And when we have um, a classifier, we're, we're really trying to put each input into you know one of a fixed number of, of classes. Um, so maybe imagine that my sh machine learning al algorithm is trying to generate a model of the world that distinguishes between um, cats and dogs, right? So maybe my training data, I have a bunch of different photos of animals and a label indicating what kind of animal they are. I feed that in, uh, do some crunching, I get this function. And then uh, in the future, I can feed other animals to it and it'll tell me, is it a dog or a cat? One of these, um, I guess here I just have two classes, right? So those are the two big things that we were going to do with supervised learning this semester, right? Do uh, re regression and classification. Okay, so let's jump over to unsupervised learning. And, um, and in this case, you can imagine maybe we have all this data about houses, uh, but you know maybe there's no information about what any house costs. And uh, maybe at this point, we don't even know what we want to predict. We want to just see, like, are there different categories of houses um, that are all kind of similar in some sort of way, right? Maybe I can, there's maybe a few different types of houses. And, um, and so this is unsupervised, right? It's not really clear what we're trying to predict or what we're trying to learn. Uh, but we could still feed that in and we could um, potentially identify different clusters of houses. Um, for example, <coughs> maybe... Um, there's one group of houses that are old and have few bathrooms, and there's these newer uh, houses, and, and they all have more bathrooms, right? There might be some similarities across columns, and um, the function in this case is not only uh, only kind of putting them in these different clusters or categories, uh, but the machine learning algorithm itself decides what these categories are. And, and because of that, that's why they have these kind of um, weird names, like cluster one, cluster two, Right, they're not something meaningful that a human came up with. The algorithm is just noticing, hey, like things tend to fall into these different different groups. Now, it's totally possible after we come up with these different clusters uh, that we could retroactively look back and then see these things like, oh, cluster one tends to be old houses with few bathrooms. Uh, but it's also possible that there will be no easy way to describe uh, what the clusters are that get um, discovered by these systems. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about the foundations we're going to build on uh, going forwards, both in terms of the math involved and um, and also the, the Python packages we'll be using. Um, three main uh, packages we'll need to be using to do machine learning and related calculations efficient, efficiently. And um, those are NumPy. Um, we've actually seen a little bit of NumPy before in 301 or 220 um, when we dealt with random number generation. Uh, PyTorch and then uh, scikit-learn uh, you can see the little pip3 install command at the bottom that you could use to install all of these if you like. Okay, so in terms of mathematical foundations, uh, we're going to have to know a little bit of linear algebra. I'm not assuming you have any background in this. Whatever you need to know, um, I'll, I'll be introducing in this course. Uh, but we are often going to be uh, kind of expressing our functions in terms of linear algebra. So you can see at the top here, I have the example before I'm mapping houses into uh, you know, predicted prices. Um, one way I could do that is uh, with these equations like this. I could say, um, you know, maybe the house, the price of the house is y, and uh, and maybe I have this input data a. You can actually see that that matrix on the left with um, two one nineteen eighty five. It's just another representation of my um, of my data frame or table on the top left. And what I can do is I can multiply that matrix uh, by a vector x maybe add something to that, and then I get another vector of predicted prices on the right. So I can easily um, express certain kinds of functions uh, as this uh, dot product between 
um, a, a matrix of data and a vector, right? And uh, and so what am I doing here? I'm just multiplying a by x. That's a dot product. I may be talking more about what the dot product is. Some of you might have already um, encountered this. It's a very convenient and efficient way uh, to implement a function like this. Um, here on the right, I have an example of some Python code that's doing that. Um, so we're importing NumPy. NumPy is the main package we're going to be learning uh, to deal with linear algebra. Um, the tradition is you say import NumPy as NP for short. And uh, if I have a data frame, it turns out that data frame.values gives me a NumPy array. And so here I'm pulling that out into variable A. And uh, then I'm doing that dot product, which um, I said we'll talk more about in the future between um, A and X. Right? And I'm just adding a number to get the to get the output. So we'll be spending a lot more time on this. Um, let me just like briefly address what this means, this linear algebra. Uh, it means that we can only really uh, multiply variables by constants and uh, add these different uh, variables together, right? So here I have at the top y equals x squared. Uh, that's not an example of a linear, linear um, equation because I'm squaring x, right? I can't multiply x by itself. I can only multiply it by um, uh, by these constant factors. Um, on the other hand, the second one uh, is in some ways simpler, in some ways more complicated. I see that um, I have 50 variables here, uh, but what I'm doing with the variables is all relatively simple. I'm, you know, I multiply x0 by 3, I multiply x1 by negative 2, so on and so forth. So I'm just multiplying and adding. And uh, so in that regard, it's kind of simpler, but it's also, um, we're often going to be seeing use cases where we have many more uh, variables, right? So it's complicated in a different way, but maybe not more complicated um, overall. Um, knowing a little bit of calculus is useful uh, for this work, but you don't need to know a lot. Uh, well, why is that? Well, calculus lets us um, optimize things, right? Maybe, maybe I know a lot of you have taken a calculus, and often we're trying to figure out, well, what x value maximizes the y? And uh, if I have some sort of equation, and calculus gives us the tools to optimize, right? We either maximize things or minimize things. <clears throat> and here, what are we going to be doing? Where I have um, our our functions or our models are going to be these things that are expressed in linear algebra often, often or in other ways. And uh, from that, we're going to get a bunch of predictions. Um, we can also even also get these predictions on data um, that uh, we know the answer to. And that's a very interesting case, right? When you can compare your predictions with the actual truth, because then you can calculate what your error is. And um, there's different ways to quantify how wrong we are. Um, typically, the function that does that is called a loss function, right? There's different ways to quantify um, our level of being mistaken, right? So I can feed my predictions and my price into a loss function. And, and I'm seeing here is a little strange because I have three and four rows. There were supposed to be four, four rows in each case. If I feed that in, I get a loss. And, uh, and of course, there's a relationship, right? If my uh, function um, is kind of doing this linear algebra matrix multiplication, uh, the coefficients I use in x definitely relate to the, that loss. Some x values are going to have a larger loss or larger error, and others will have something that's smaller. And, uh, and so that's what we want to optimize, right? We want to figure out what x should I use uh, to make my loss as small as possible. And so the concepts we're going to need to know um, for that are, you know, what is a derivative in calculus, or how can I compute a gradient? Um, I think most of you have uh, been exposed to that, uh, but if not, don't worry, we'll be talking more about it um, enough, you know, to get you through this course. <clears throat> now, we've seen a lot of cases this semester where we are trying to make our code faster, right? We want to reduce the complexity, avoid expensive operations, uh, but a lot of the stuff that you're doing with machine learning is just inherently um, computationally expensive, right? It takes a long time to do. And, um, and so if something takes a long time to do, uh, one strategy people often will rely on is parallelism. And parallelism means that you break your work into pieces and you work on multiple pieces at the same time. And, uh, and there's different ways you could do that. You can imagine one way is that uh, you could just buy a lot of computers, right? And all the computers are, are doing some computation at the same time. Um, as I mentioned way back at the beginning of the semester though, um, a lot of modern CPUs, most of them, have uh, multiple cores in them. And a core is really like a mini CPU, even though it's on the one big CPU chip, right? So that's one way we can run uh, many things at a time. 
Now, something is kind of, uh, it's interesting how things have evolved in the hardware world. Uh, we used to think about using uh, CPU for kind of most co computations. And uh, then we would buy these graphics cards, these graphics uh, processing units or GPUs that would just be for um, kind of handling the video or the monitor um, and what we see there. And especially for gaming, right? That can be very computationally um, intensive. Uh, and, and it turns out that work, even though it's very computationally intensive to do graphics, uh, it's very easy to parallelize. It's very easy to break it up into a lot of different um, pieces and, and work on those independently. And so because of that, GPUs um, have evolved to have many cores in them uh, that are generally not as powerful as a CPU or as flexible, uh, but they've really built these graphics hard to have lots and lots of cores. And so it turns out that a modern GPU might have thousands of cores. Um, in contrast, you know, my laptop probably has like eight cores or maybe a, a really nice desktop computer might have like 32 cores, right? But definitely not thousands. And so even though these graphics cards were, of course, originally built for graphics, it turns out they're tremendously useful for certain types of scientific computing uh, and machine learning. They make things like multiply matrices really fast or computing gradients. And, uh, and so for this, right, we aren't going to get into the details of like buying GPUs and figuring out how to directly run code on them, but we're going to learn a framework called PyTorch. And PyTorch is cool because it lets you write code to run on your CPU. And then you can make some relatively small changes and start running your code on a GPU without having all this kind of specialized knowledge about how GPUs work. Right, so we won't be running anything on GPUs this uh, semester, but we will be using PyTorch to do um, some mathematical operations and compute gradients and to optimize things, really. Okay, so those are the foundations that we have. Uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, kind of our approach in this course. Uh, we're going to be taking the course of uh, practitioners, and maybe it's easiest to explain what a practitioner is in contrast with somebody else, right? So here I have this picture, I have a machine learning algorithm. There are people out there who are deeply mathematical, you know, maybe they have a PhD in machine learning, and they're inventing and writing new algorithms uh, for machine learning and improving on the existing ones. And, uh, and that's not our focus here. We aren't trying to develop new algorithms. And, and, and even for existing known algorithms, we generally won't write the code for that. We will in a few simple cases, but generally no. Uh, so what we are interested in, instead of doing that, is treating these algorithms as a black box. Um, so I'm starting with that gear in the middle. Uh, let, let's say that we have some package or, uh, or module that has many different machine learning algorithms in it. Um, how can we pick the right ones and use it effectively? And how can we configure them? Um, so the, the Python package we're going to be using here is scikit-learn. When you import it, it's sklearn. And they have lots of different machine uh, learning al algorithms that other people have um, uh, written. And our focus is really going to be on, on kind of choosing the right ones and using it. Now, it turns out that a lot of these algorithms um, work if we kind of clean up our data in various ways. And uh, so that's going to be a big focus. How can we get our data sets ready uh, to feed into um, these machine learning algorithms? There, there's lots of things where, uh, where maybe the algorithm performs better if the average value is zero, uh, where we divide by the standard deviation, things like that that we're going to have to do um, uh, to make some of these algorithms work well. And so that's something we do want to have some expertise with. Then the other thing that's really important is if we're trying to try different um, algorithms, it might not always be intuitively obvious which one's going to do the best. Uh, so it's going to be really crucial that we can evaluate how well um, an algorithm is doing. And we can try different ones and compare and uh, ultimately pick the best ones. That's going to be another big focus um, kind of, uh, for the rest of this semester. Okay, so I'll have a few review questions um, uh, in the lecture document. And so try those before moving on to the next uh, next part.